Our next speaker is Professor Ricky Ang, Head of Science, Maths and Technology at SUTD. He was trained as a theoretical and computer scientist whose research interests are in the development of theoretical scaling laws and models. They are able to capture the essential physics and any interesting problems. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'll keep it short. I think it's a long day. Uh, so I'm, even though I publish a lot of paper in physics, but strictly speaking, I'm not a physicist. Uh, because none of my degree is offered from a physics department. It's, my degree is always in the interdisciplinary department. Okay, I just had this slide add on half an hour ago because throughout this morning, I think uh, none of us actually uh, shared the news that actually KK was awarded APS Fellow in 2009. So if you read this news, this is significantly accomplishment. I just do a very quick Google from the database. So in Singapore history, okay, uh, there are less than 10 uh, from NUS. So this is simply, you are using this slide. Actually, if I only have one slide to present, I'll stop here, right? So uh, congratulations, uh, congratulations to uh, KK Pua again. So it, I was difficult to think about what topic to do. They, they say something about recently, uh, but I'm not a physicist. Then I will divide my talk into four parts. I know uh, KK uh, is so-called very passionate about physics education. So the last two parts is talking about some of the SUTD pedagogy. We, we don't offer phy physics uh, degree, but we are probably the, engin the only engineering department in Singapore that we still request the student need to take two semesters of physics in their year one. You can go to NUS, NDU Engineering School. They are not longer required to do two semesters of physics. Uh, as long as I'm there, I, I still keep this one, but my boss may change it. Okay, okay so memory. Uh, I, was, I joined uh, NDU probably end of 2001. At that time, NTU, there's no physics department, so I was actually uh, recruited by KK, first PhD student, right, Professor Kam from Triple E. Uh, so I was an assistant professor. And then somehow, I don't know what happened, okay, uh, KK simply asked me to, to help out uh, a bit in the IS. Of course, most of the work, as just now Quake mentioned, Quake do most of the work, <laughs> okay. So, uh, the first time that I heard about KK, uh, I was a Malaysian, so my hometown is just two hour drive from Singapore. Uh, of course, I, my parents all are educated, Chinese educated family, so I, I speak Mandarin very well. Uh, my father went to study in Nanta, uh, unfortunately, because of family reason, not able to do. So uh, after my high school, uh, I'm from a Chinese independent high school, I went to Taiwan. So uh, in, back in Taiwan, when I did my PhD later, nuclear engineering in Michigan, then postdoc in Los Alamos, uh, I met many, many of the Asian uh, physicists, engineers. Uh, they always tell me, when, I, when they know I'm from this region, do you know KK Poa? Okay, actually, this is simply showing that how well-known KK uh, is. So I always admire KK great passion and commitment in physics and also the STEM education. So there are many, many activities. I think many of my colleagues have mentioned about IAS. Uh, I just highlight three. Because of this small elevation affiliation with IAS, I personally able to met some of them. So <clears throat> I always believe that, very interesting in a Singapore context, that the engineering students don't learn quantum. Okay, very few. Okay, I try to impose in uh, SUTD, backfire. Basically, the student don't see why I need to learn about quantum. Okay, so anyhow, I arranged uh, uh, Professor Chang Nippon able to conduct a short courses of quantum technology in Triple E. Okay, uh, I think the feedback was good in the sense that because it's an informal course, there's no exam, all these things. So the student okay to learn. Then, of course, uh, we learn books from Kelsen Wang. 
Then uh, one story shared with Kirsten Huang to me, when he gave a talk in study of physics and porting, I ha ever have a chance to interact with him, this personal story. He shared that actually back in MIT, quite a while ago, MIT tried a simple experiment. They tried to teach quantum mechanics first before teaching classical physics. Okay? They take a small group to do that, and then he shared with me that he see no reason why the student need to learn quantum, uh, need to learn classical physics first before learning quantum. He's, he said re there's no reason. But he said in MIT experiment failed as well. The, the student simply cannot take it. There's a reason why the, the, the custom is always you learn about uh, the classical physics, EM, statistical physics, all these things, then eventually go to quantum. So this is just some personal story. Since I'm working in the engineering school right now, then of course I'm always a admirer of Xian Yang. I, I'm from Tsinghua University. Uh, uh, back in 1991, uh, four Nobel laureate, uh, Xian Yang, uh, uh, T.D. Lee, and uh, Li Yanzhe, and uh, Ding Zhao Zhong, right? Four of them came to Tsinghua, uh, Xinchu. They actually gave us a very big, uh, uh, so-called symposium to encourage uh, Taiwanese students uh, to pursue STEM education. Uh, so at that time, I was, I think, year two or year three undergraduate. So uh, then through KK, I'm able to meet Xian Yang personally and able to get his signature on the collection of books, actually published by World Scientific as well. So this, this is just some personal story. A lot of time, when you want to decide to be a scientist, it's not about the technical work, it's the inspiration. I believe that KK have done a lot of great work in inspire young students and help the young scientists uh, to meet uh, the so-called uh, uh, giants in the field. Okay, so I move on. Uh, uh, my research is, is quite an uh, isolated area of emission interface physics. I don't think you will get any of your interest. Uh, so I, 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 I start to learn this fractional calculus back in about 2017. Uh, then we start to work on some simple problem. We able to get some funding from US uh, 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 Navy research grant because they 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 they, 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 they seek funding. They like they they, are, they don't really care what the thing want to do. So I using the opportunity to study some of the topics. So I pick a few topics that all the undergraduate student year one year two will understand, and then try to using fractional calculus to do something. Okay. So, turn out that uh, uh, fractional calculus is actually quite a useful tool. For clean problem, it's useless. But for very dirty problem, it turned out to be a useful tool. Okay? So this is a key, key, signal, key, key message that I would like to share with the students. So let's look at dimension. We're talking about fractional. Okay? So all of you know how to define one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. Right? So I'm an engineer, computation engineer scientist. So if you want to simulate a particular object or system, the object may not be a very nice 1D, 2D, 3D. You always need to use multi-scale. You need to do all kind of things to do. Okay? But essentially, you solve the equation. It's always one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. You make the grid cell smaller, that kind of things. Right? So all of you know how to define the dimension. This is a mathematical definition. Right, the D dimension of object is defined as the log number of cell similar pieces. Right, so for example, easily you take the cube, you calculate the number of cube is twenty seven. If you look at the magnification from the small cube to the whole distance is three. So log seven divided by log three dimension is three. So there is a mathematical definition of uh, uh, dimension. So if you, I just list out two. Two uh, so-called very common. Actually, there are thousands of these kind of factors patterns. You can actually Google online. Okay, so for example, you look at this Sebastian's carpet. You draw. You take a piece of paper. You draw a triangle. Then you do an anti triangle. The middle part you you throw away, and then you repeat the same pattern right here. Just imagine the middle part. The paper you take away. Take away. Take away. So this particular paper is no longer a paper anymore. So if you're using that mathematical definition, this is object which 1.58. Just imagine that right now, if you want to simulate this object, yeah, you likely is using a two-dimensional object, X and Y. 
then you have to do very multi small scale to do the calculation. Okay, you don't actually do look at this, you don't do the simulation at 1.58 dimension. So same thing, this is called merger sponge. You take a cube, right? Then the, the pattern is on the middle, you always repeat the cube. So if you take this particular part, it's log 27 minus 7 divided by log 3. So this dimension is 2.727, okay? So this is, if you, those of you who want to know this, you can read these uh, famous books, okay? This is basically the, the factors, okay, back in uh, 1983. Then you, you can argue that while all these patterns are very common patterns, in real life, they may not have such patterns. So let's take an object. This is an image of an object. We have some roughness, meaning the surface is not perfectly flat, right? So mathematicians are able to using some box counting method. So what you eventually you do is you draw a small circle with some small radius r. You move along this image. You do image processing. Then you try to count. The number of count is basically saying that for finite some roughness, you define his score at one point. Then you calculate the number of m. So this, for example, the, the circle one is the number of box counting. Then you try to fit it and then try to find the slope. So the dimension is defined when this r goes smaller and smaller. So for example, this particular object is a real object that I capture from a, a, a journal paper because I need to capture what is the physical dimension of that object because I want to use my model to explain it. Then this is something, the dimension is 1.707, right? So this is simply saying that you, you can classify the object by, by using this kind of technique, okay? So all of us learn calculus from high school, right? Calculus. So you know how to do differentiation, df, dx, d square f, dx square, expression, right? D3 is always an integer power. So it turned out that calculus was developed at the time when the paper was written, okay? Uh, one of the mathematicians actually asked them, how do you perform fractional order of differentiation? Okay? So this question has been actually solved by many, many mathematicians, okay? I'm not a mathematician, okay? So I, I'm not able to tell the history. But then for the past 20 years or so, the fractional calculus has become very mature, meaning that people have been using this tool to solve many uh, um, uh, engineering uh, uh, applied physics problems. So for example, there are two well-known definitions of fractional calculus. Okay, most of the people is using Caputo, okay? So when you're using this kind of different operation to do your solving equation, there's no fixed rule. The best way to do is you do your calculation and then you compare with the experiment result or compare with the tra traditional calculation. So I have done probably maybe 10 such studies, so I just simply list three of them. So this is simply a diagram mathematically I want to perform the differentiation of an exponential minus x squared function. So you can actually calculate what is the differentiation. You can see the, is the, the order of differentiation is actually fractional. So you, numerically, you can actually calculate it. Okay? There are actually very three good books. This is the first book that I learned, actually from World Scientific as well. <laughs> okay. So it's a fractional calculus, uh, an introduction for physicists. As I said, I'm not a mathematician. So this is a very nice book, uh, thanks to KK. Then of course, the other two books, uh, Bruce West is actually worked in the uh, uh, US uh, Army's research lab. And then of course, this is a book by Springer. Okay, so I'm a, I was trained as a plasma physicist. So basically, the plasma was oscillated due to the attracting charge. So the equation is basically a simple harmonic oscillator. So I was thinking, instead of doing the second order differentiation, can I do fractional order? What it means is, so what is, what is the meaning of this? This, this sort of fractional oscillator is not new. I'm not the first one who do that. But in the plasma context, it's basically saying that your, your oscillation in the plasma system right now has collision. Okay, so meaning that you don't really have to include a collision term in your differentiation equation. You just have to fractionize the time operator. It mimics actually the oscillation. 
So I show you the calculation. So you can show the calculation, then there's a mathematical form, okay? But I think most important thing is this. You can see that right now, I basically make this order differentiation instead of a perfect thing. I can see right now the oscillation damp, right? So it's a very simple, harmo uh, simple harmonic damp oscillator. Then you can ask, is there any difference? Yes, there is some difference. So what I did is, I, I get the solution and then I compare the tradition approach if you're including some collision in the system, right? Then the collision, the, the equation will be look something like this. Then for very, very small collision, actually it turned out to agree very well. But if you right now go to gamma equal to 0.75, a strong collision, actually you're using the fractional model to calculate in the traditional uh, so-called uh, 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 dissipative force, it into the force law to do the calculation, it's actually different. Of course, we do not know which one is true. The best way to do is perform experiment, okay? There's no experiment, okay? Then, of course, this is also in our year two physics, right? You take an interface, you calculate how is the fractional coefficient from an interface. So, very simple questions. I basically consider, oh, right now this interface is rough. It's not a perfect interface. So in engineering, actually, many, many of such problems occur. So what I do is I consider this interface has some thickness. And then this thickness, I can do the imaging to check what kind of roughness that I have. Am I right? Because I actually able to get the experiment result. Then I can actually using the box counting method to determine what is the roughness. And then I define the fractional dimension of that particular layer. So I perform the same. I basically what I did is I basically solved the Maxwell equation in the fractional dimension using the mathematical tools developed by the mathematician. So it simply play with maths. Play, you know, derive. Then eventually it's a closed form. Then of course, is it true or is it simply just playing mathematics just for fun? And then we search for paper, and then it turned out that there is three papers. They're using laser to make the material rough then they calculate what is the absorption. And then for each of the paper, I can actually take the image from the paper, right? And then I can determine the roughness. And then you can see that the blue line is the calculation, the, the solid line, the, the symbol is actually the experiment. Okay, so it turned out to be quite nice, okay? Last problem, this is actually the first paper that I did experiment myself. Uh, I waste one year in Michigan, one year to become an experimentalist. Uh, I broke the 400K machine, so that PI actually kicked me out from the group. <laughs> okay, but anyhow, uh, uh, I, 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 meaning I don't, don't go into experiment. So let's consider a very simple one dimension uh, capacitor. So we know the capacitance is proportional to area divided by gap spacing, right? This is the dimension, L is, so for example, if right now you, you take a square with a length of L, A alpha should be two, then the gap spacing should be beta should be one, right? This is a simple uh, uh, one dimension capacitance. So what I did is, let's assuming beta is equal to one. I take a piece of the metal uh, uh, direction material, I can, I can actually using, for example, computer software to create different kind of fractal structure, am I right? Because it's easy to create this such pattern. For example, you can use CST or you can use COMSO. After I create it, I simply apply the voltage. Then I ask the COMSO, because COMSO is commercial software, he can make the grid cell as small as possible. Then he can calculate what is the capacitance. Then you can see that actually the symbol, uh, the simulation result, and then the solid line and the Dash line are the calculation determined by my model. Of course, you can see there are two values of alpha because there's one alpha is a theoretical factor. Because for this creating this pattern, this theoretical alpha, mathematically, you have to repeat the pattern infinity large in order to reach that alpha. But in my simulation, I can't do that. I can only do maybe four repetitions. So the alpha value, there's a difference. Okay? Same thing. You, you may consider, well, the structure that you create is too simple, so I can actually ask the software to randomly take a cube to randomly fill up the dielectric material. So it means totally random, fill up. 
I, I would know that, for example, the filling up ratio is, for example, 20%, 80%, or 70%. Am I right? Then I can calculate the fractal property of this particular directed material. And then I using my model to do the calculation. So the agreement still quite well, not perfectly well, but it simply gives me confidence that, wow, actually, if you solve the electrostatic equation in the fraction number I mentioned, for a simple problem like this, it works. Okay? Then I do experiment. Uh, SUTD, all the students know how to using 3D printing. I don't need to pay a single cent. So I simply ask the uh, undergraduate student, take certain directric, do some uh, directory material so that I can measure the capacitance. So the student right now is actually he's a DSA scholar, and then he's right now doing engineering in Stanford, okay, PhD. So he, he, he using 3D printing to break the structure, then we simply take a metal plate, then we actually measure, take the wire, measure the capacitance. As you can see that we only prove the scaling because they are contact resistant many, many things that we cannot account the total value. But you can see actually the train looks very well. So this is in terms of length. And then this is in terms of gap spacing because I can create a something called canter set so that I can check. So uh, the fitting is quite well, okay? Then of course, if you want to real, very, very go to very, uh, uh, very uh, fine comparison, you can actually using the console. And then the agreement is very well. And then using console, you take you how many hours? This one probably three hours. But using my model is analytical. Okay, so that is the advantage of using this particular fractional calculus. Though there's totally no physics, new physics at all. Okay. Okay, lastly, this is the recent work. So since I'm able to fractional any ODE, okay. In principle, PD can do also. Actually, the PD is still not very well developed, but any OD you give me, I can fractionize it. Okay? So uh, I think I forgot already. I believe there's a seminar arranged by IAS by George West and uh, Bertrand Bertrand got talking about the science of city or something. Okay, I was in Los Alamos, so I know Santa Fe Institute quite well. Uh, 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 but uh, Louis Bertrand uh, was like me was a, a Los Alamos director fellow. Uh, he's probably three, four years ahead of me. So he published a paper, right, talking about the scaling of cities. S mathematically, it's very simple. It's simply a simple ODE, right? So he, he, he considered that, for example, the resource required for this city is must be need to have some maintained by the population. And then when your population, DNDT, increase, what is the cost for you to add up this thing? So this equation can be solved by hand. Okay? So you can actually predict how the population raised as a function of city. Okay? So then it come up a very simple question. How can the city behave like a real physics system that responds instantaneously? Am I right? City do there's no law to govern city that he behaves like a physics that dynamic that instantaneous change. So I just play around. I said, let's consider the CT have memory effect. Instead of solving the, the operator using the normal ODE, what I did is I simply fractionized the left-hand side. So I fractionized it. Then I have a numerical code able to solve it. Then I can calculate what is the population as a function of time. Then population as a function of time with respect to the performance of a city, you can collect the data. Then I can compare my model compared to Louis Bernanke model, which one agree better. Okay, so we look at the transport delay in USA. I forgot how many cities. Then I divided into two. You can see that the FOM in linear fractional approach is actually giving better agreement, less than five percent. I consider good. Normally, that's how people define, right? 95%. And then you can see this is agree good. So meaning that indeed, the, the city behave memory. In order to have better agreement, you have to using fractional calculus. Same thing, I look at the water supply in China. Uh, then you can actually look at it. Some, some, some city simply don't have that much, okay? but, but most of it, it would. Like for example, Hebei, okay? 
uh, I forgot how many city, but majority of city, you actually, a uh, fractional model give better agreement. How about electricity? How is the response of Singapore electricity? I look at four countries, Singapore, Canada, Switzerland, and New Zealand. It turned out that Singapore and, let's see, New Zealand need to use fractional model to do a better agreement. Okay? Of course, these are all mathematical tools. I don't know why, but the data already show you that you, you, you cannot use simple ODE to, to fit with the experiment result. So I moved to the last part. I know KK is here. KK is very interesting on physics education. So I do some promotion for SUTD. As I just now mentioned, uh, we are the only engineering school in Singapore who still request all the engineering students need to do two semesters of physics in year one. Okay? So I, I want to play a short video. So in SUTD, all our courses require project. So the project is not experiment, there is no finite answer. So for example, for this particular project, the metric is basically you have to build a car, there is no battery. Okay? We teach them how to, how to move the car. Then the car has to carry certain weight. The amount of weight, up to you to decide. Then you have to finish this particular trajectory as fast as possible. So clearly, if you carry a very high weight, you, you move slowly, right? So there's a balance. That is the design come about. So you think you have to think about how do you strike the balance using physics principle in order to school score high marks. And then, for example, this particular project is a team project, typically four to five students. And then I don't know how, how to calculate. The eventually, you add up the percentage. is about 25% of their final grade. Okay? So same thing. I show you this. This is a term two. It's basically electromagnetics. Basically, uh, we change the project every year. So this is basically looks something like this. At the end, the instructor will bring an AM radio inside. But the... The, the student do not know what is the AM frequency. They know only a certain range. So they have to using build an inductor, tunable inductor. They cannot buy. They have to build using recycled material. And then buy an inductor. Because like what? LC circuit is basically create a resonance. Right? So when we bring the AM radio inside, then the student know how to using Faraday door to make a speaker. Then the challenge is, within two hours, we go to the each group, we listen to your speaker. Did your design able to extract the frequency? If you do not able to extract, you lose marks. So the student basically know about this process that in week four, they make the capacitor, in week Seven, they make the uh, inductor, then eventually they have to assemble it together. So this, all these are basically what we try to encourage the students by learning physics and then try to using their hands-on skill okay, to improve. So it's a balance of making A-level students have to have hands-on and then making poly students uh, so-called learn some theory. So that there's a mixture, there's a balance. So they don't feel that actually physics is everything about solving equation and theory. Anyhow, we are engineering school. Uh, we, 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 don't, we, we, we take the risk of being a little bit more so-called uh, casual. And then finally, <coughs> I think in next few months, uh, you probably will heard about the first batch of a scholarship, pre unisys scholarship fund by MOE. The scholarship is called ERTP, Engineering Technology Research Program. So they will pick, every year they will pick 100 JC1 students. I think NUS High are including part of the uh, program. Then these students in JC2, they have to do a workshop. Okay, so FU, SUTD have been pilot run for the past two years to run the workshop. The workshop is a five-day workshop. Basically, we, in SUTD, we call Da Vinci at SUTD. So it's not experiment. It's basically STEM 
plus art plus design because the product has to look nice and then eventually you have to combine engineering, coding and physics together. So, for example, the two workshops that we do is about drones. So right now the students know how to write a coding to make the drone fly automatically. They also learn the, the simple P versus MP problem. Uh, then, of course, uh, the challenge too is they know how to using AI software to put into the robot to go to a certain place to look at this object, identify this is human. They want to rescue it. So it's a five days program fund by uh, uh, MOE. Uh, so next year program, uh, 100 students will come to SUTD for this scholar. Then the other 100 students will actually go to NTU. And then after that, it will be NUS, SIT, then we keep repeating. So I think the MOE is very, very worried about students are not choosing engineering. There's a very huge drop of talented students choosing engineering. If you look at their so-called top 15% in the A-level result. So anyhow, I simply uh, conclude my, my presentation and then uh, celebrate KK and then for his passion in physics and STEM education in Singapore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky.